We're going to start the webinar now. Let me introduce uh, Maria Kaisar. She's one of our faculty member, uh, as, uh, specifically in Paristology department. She has uh, as, uh, the degree Bachelor of Science at the Department of Biology, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, University of Indonesia, and also uh, finished her PhD at the Department of Parasitology, Leiden University Medical Center the, in the Netherlands. You can see her professional work experiences and also the key publications and uh, her interest, uh, uh, research interest is about immunoparasitology. Okay, uh, Maria, please take the lead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ika, for your uh, introduction. And we actually, uh, uh, shortly we start our webinar. Uh, the, the, the broad title of this webinar is Increasing Awareness of an Infectious Disease, Pityosis, is it endemic in Indonesia? And we are very happy uh, that uh, Professor Tirapong, Pra Tirapong Prajajan uh, have time to join this webinar and share her fi his findings through this webinar. And we hope that uh, more people will come and join us and see uh, uh, fantastic works of uh, you and your field and your team. Uh, but first, we're going to hear also from our uh, faculty members, uh, Dr. Hanna, who recently finished her PhD uh, in the, from group of uh, Professor Tirapong. Uh, Dr. Hanna has uh, started her... Uh, she joined the uh, Department uh, of, uh, of Pharmacology in uh, Atmajaya. And she finished her bachelor medicine from uh, Pajajaran University of Indonesia, got her medical doctor degree from the same university and got her master uh, of health in 2018 from UNPAD as well. And as I mentioned earlier that she just finished her PhD, uh, doctor of philosophy from Mahidol University, Thailand under supervision of uh, Professor Tirapong Prajajan. Her research uh, interest is in mycology, especially in phytiosis and phytium insidiosum. She got uh, published her works in a, a high uh, international peer review. And one of the uh, couple of uh, her key findings also in the field of phytium insidiosum. And she is shortly will present and share her findings in title with the title of epidemiology and clinical manifestation of pityosis so uh, uh dr hana please uh share your uh, expertise to us okay thank you bumaria <clears throat> i will share my slide first Okay, can you see my slide? <clears throat> yes, it's clear. Okay. So, hello everyone. I will start my presentation. It's about the epidemiology and clinical manifestation of ethiosis. I start my presentation with some question. What is ethiosis? Is it a disease in human? What are the clinical manifestations of phytiosis look like? Does this disease exist in Indonesia? And what is the cause of this disease? And I divided my presentation into three chapters, distribution and clinical manifestation. OK. 
Okay, this is a, we talk about the history first. This is a review about the fitting in situsum. And when I read this article for the first time, I was surprised because of the sentence that I give, put, I put in the red box. The agent causing the disease was isolated for the first time in 1901 by that scientist working with horses in Indonesia and again in 1924 by another Dutch. So actually this organism was isolated for the first time in here. And I tried to collect uh, the articles from Han and who came out related with the hypomasses destruents. And for example, like this article, uh, they isolate, isolated the hypomasses destruents in laboratorium. So well, the Freden is means Batavia, Java, Netherlands, or Indian in India, Belanda in here. And you can see in this article that there are many other terms to describe this particular disease, for example, Bursati, Espundia, and the other terms. And we will uh, take a look at this old article a little bit. For example, like this article in published in 1884, more than 100 years ago. And this article, Mr. Smith used the term Bursati. It means the rainy season. So it means that it's related to the water. And then in this article, he tried to uh, demonstrate what he found in the tissue from horse tissue, from cutaneous ulcer. And then he found that the organism, uh, I think I need to write. Uh, the organism looks like a filamentous, high filamentous uh, fungi like this. And then uh, he got many cases about the ulcer in horses in India at the time. And then this is the article in 1974. This article, it refers to the term hypomycosis destruction equi, same with the Han and Hukheimer. And this is in this article, uh, they report four cases, uh, swarm cancer, this is the term they use in horses in the central district of Papua New Guinea, which closely agreed with the limited description available of hypomasses destruction. So basically they report the similar uh, clinical manifestation to what Han and Hook Kemmer uh, reported. And in this in this work they were able to successfully stimulate this organism to produce the so to produce the spores because usually uh, in the previous article before 1974 the scientists demonstrate only the filamentous hyphae however but they didn't demonstrate how the sporan sporangium looks like so in this article they uh, demonstrate the spore and based on what they found, they uh, could uh, identify that this organism belongs to the genus Phytium. So this is in 1974. And this is a paper one year later from Colombia. Uh, they report a similar uh, condition in horses with the term Espundia equina, uh, etiology pathogenesis phycomycosis. This is the paper from Japan, uh, uh, six years later. And they refer the work from Auschwitz and Copland. They use the name Phytium, but in this, in this article, they give the name Phytium gracile. And they report a similar condition in horses, like cutaneous uh, ulcer in horses, granulomatous skin disease in Kagoshima prefecture. This is the work from Miller in Australia, uh, similar condition with hypomesis testosterone equi. This is from USA, but this is in dogs. This is different. Yeah, previous paper from horse, and this is dogs, gastrointestinal pityosis, 60 cases uh, in dogs. It's from Louisiana State University in USA. This is from Costa Rica. Uh, in horses, and this is the first uh, reported human phytiosis in Thailand. Uh, the first occurrence of the disease 
presented as subcutaneous lesion at Sri Raj Hospital in 1985 uh, into thalassemic males as a granulomatous ulcer. So this is the first reported cases of human vitiosis in 1985, the occurrence. So we can learn in here that there are many terms uh, like 50 years. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that there are many terms to describe this condition. But if we compare those articles, we can see that they have the similarity, for example, that they demonstrate uh, the etiology as broad receptor HIV. And then they also say that uh, the risk factor is contact with the water. Until in 1987, in this time, in this year, it is a big moment in here because of the publication of this article that we can see in the next slide. Okay. So this is in 1987. In this work, this work is a collaboration between a CPS Netherlands and Division of Mycotic Disease, CTC. Uh, in this work, they collect the isolates, many isolates from Papua New Guinea that I show in my previous slide, and then Japan, Thailand, human fetiosis, USA, and Costa Rica. They collect all of the isolates and then they try to identify it. Uh, and they found that those isolates actually same one species. So in this article, they gave the complete description of a new species, Vitium in situosum, as the etiologic agent of vitiosis. After this year, uh, we have uh, this uniform term, which is Vitium in situosum, to describe this organism. and uh, the disease, we call it fetiosis. And after this year, we can see that there are many uh, papers talk about how to diagnose and also the case report. <clears throat> so what is vitim in situosum? Is it fungal? Vitim in situosum is an oomycet. So oomycet traditionally uh, was classified in the kingdom fungi, but now we know that it is in uh, Straminopiles close relation with algae. And this is how the vitim in situ sum looks like, like a, like a fungi. And if we compare between oomycet and a fungi, uh, this is, uh, I show a uh, few differences, but actually uh, they have many differences. For example, uh, I show in here oomycet reads of cellulose in their cell wall, but fungi reads of chitin. For my set, lack of ergosterol, but fungi uh, rich of ergosterol and, the, and many other differences. Uh, chapter two, I talk about the uh, epidemiology. Uh, the data that I will show in this presentation uh, are extracted in this article. So if you want to take a look more detail, you can read this paper. So in this work, we uh, collect the reported cases from 1980 until 2021, so 41 years. So, and then we collect uh, 5,000 cases. And then we have the exclusion criteria. For example, we exclude the duplicate case. And then we include uh, 4,000 cases that we uh, make this bar, 4,000 cases. And we can see in here, uh, in 1980 until 2021, 57% <clears throat> of the cases were reported in the last 10 years. So it means that it could be uh, the number of cases is increased or maybe it could be the awareness of the clinician to diagnose this particular disease is increased. And uh, in here, we made a global map. Uh, red color means that those country report uh, reported the fetuses cases. The total country in here that we mark with red is 23 countries. But uh, most of them is in the tropical, subtropical countries and few of them is in temperate region. But interestingly is in here in Indonesia, we need to keep in our mind that in history, this organism was first isolated in here. So we believe that this organism is exist in here, but you know this is like the country around us: Thailand, Malaysia, India, Australia, Papua New Guinea. They report fetuses cases, but in Indonesia, there is no report yet. 
So maybe uh, because of it looks similar with the other disease, so maybe misdiagnosed with the other disease. This is something that we need to investigate further. How about the yellow star in here? It is a, we want to show that there are about eight articles. They take the samples from the environment and they found lithium in situ from the environment. For example, like this article, they collect the sample water from like rice party field and then from a pond like this that in Indonesia, there are many rice party fields and also many pond like this, pond like that. So maybe we can uh, try to investigate in our environment as well. And this is one of the result that uh, red dot means that they were able to isolate lithium in situ in this area. And in this map, I want to show that in the last two years, because this project, uh, we collect the papers, the articles up to 2024. But so in the last two years, actually, there are many uh, reported cases from Thailand, China, India, USA. But interestingly, the, the new country, Italy, Italy reported two cases of ethiosis this year that I, I keep with the green dot. <clears throat> and the next chapter is about the clinical manifestations. Uh, human ethiosis, 74% manifests as ocular and then vascular, cutan, and only 1% systemic. And the mortality rate is 13%. How about the animal ethiosis? Most of them is cutaneous ethiosis and then GI tract and others uh, other forms and the mortality rate is about 34 percent in human fetiosis 74 74 percent of ocular fetiosis they need uh, 93 percent need surgery eye surgery like a uh, corneal transplantation or enucleation evisceration how about the vascular fetiosis 87 percent need amputation and even though they had been amputated, but 32% of them and, and in death. And this is the example of uh, how the pityosis uh, clinical manifestation. This is a sample of uh, severe skin and soft tissue pityosis. If we take a look the condition like this, maybe we can think many diagnoses. So for example, like, this case, 58-year-old male with three progressive, well, circumscribed erythematous like this. And then we had a uh, history, had waited in hot spring. And from biopsy, uh, the, uh, they found the filamentous uh, hyphae like that. And then they give the like antifungi. But three weeks later, uh, the tissue, uh, this patient got uh, ex extensive tissue necrotic that need the bilony amputation start from lesion like this. And from the molecular diagnostic, uh, they found that it, this is uh, caused by vitium in situ zoom. This is the example of supraingonal vascular vitiosis. Uh, 35 year old male and smoker thalassemic phase. He had the chronic gangrenous ulcer. Uh, in his right leg, and also plum in here. And we can see the difference between his two legs. And in here, in angiogram, this is vascular. You can see that the vascularization in his right leg is diminished. And maybe there's obstruction in here, and this area, the obstruction in here. And after surgery, it was one that is pityosis and uh, with many treatment, uh, the patient, uh, the, the condition of this condition is getting was getting worse, and at the end, uh, he has he had amputation, like this. This is a similar case, but in a child, ten year old boy, similar, uh, like gangrenous ulcer, and from angiogram, there is an obstruction, and at the end, this child. Uh, had to be amputated his right leg. This is the example of the keratitis vitiosis. This is the patient from Malaysia, actually, 35, 32 year old. And in Malaysia, 
he was treated with many drugs but failed and then he tried to look for the better treatment in or like in Australia at the time and in Australia the condition is like this is already bad and the patient got the corneal transplantation like this the corneal transplantation <clears throat> This is a victim institution keratitis in an Australian child, three year old girl, uh, conjunctivitis after swimming in public and backyard swimming pool. But 20 days in treatment, her eyes condition was getting worse like this. And the only way to save her eye is corneal transplantation. And after he got the, uh, she got the corneal transplantation and it was one that is pitium pitiosis. This is the uh, rare necrotizing orbital and partial infection uh, start from inflammation in her lower eyelid like this just inflammation but it's, it was getting worse and expand to her eye and then scalp and then all of her face and neck and he, she had the respiratory distress and then uh, he seen it about one year for treatment and at the end uh, her eye had to be enucleated her left eye and also she need to to have the multiple reconstructive plastic surgery because this infection this inflammation like spread to all of her face and destroy uh, her face this is a report case report from china two years ago Victim in Sibiosum keratitis reported in China, pricing the alertness to this fungus-like infection. Uh, they report three cases of keratitis, and after uh, culture, molecular, and multitop, they found that it is pityosis, and all of them had to had to get the corneal transplantation, but uh, they had recurrency because of the extensiveness of the infection. So the first corneal transplantation was failed and then they got the multiple corneal transplantation but failed. And then at the end, uh, they, their eye need to be uh, re removed their eye and nucleation. This is the example. So in the previous slide, I want to show the examples of the uh, pityosis in human. And the next slide I want to show in, in animal, for example, in horse, like this, in granulomatous ulcer, in uh, their abdomen or their leg, in the part that usually immerse in the water. And this is study from Brazil. There are many animals can get the pityosis. For example, this is uh, in goat. This is cow and dog as well. Uh, but, in pityosis in dog, most often is a gastrointestinal, so like the uh, like mass inside the gastrointestinal that can make the obstruction of the lumen. And this is a rare case, but I just want to show that pityosis uh, is reported in bird and then tiger and camel as well. This is my summary. Pityosis has been reported worldwide, and how about in Indonesia? So we need to investigate whether actually there is a pityosis in animal or human, or maybe we can do like, uh, like take samples from environment as well. The clinical manifestation of pityosis mimic to the other disease. It is a progressive and life-threatening disease, and it is a disease in either human or animals. Thank you. This is, I think, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hanna, for your uh, presentation. It's quite surprising to me as well because uh, the cases are very, very, uh, looks uh, very, very uh, uh, called severe and really life-threatening. And I think, uh, yeah, indeed, we need to uh, start to be more aware of uh, this uh disinfections. And I think for any one of you that have question, uh, you can drop the question in the chat box or uh, we can combine the uh, questions later in the Q&A section. And for that, then we shall continue with uh, Professor 
Tirapong Prajajan. I think I need help for the slide. Uh, for for uh, for Doctor Mas Oce, or I can also share from my uh, screen. Okay. Right. So, okay, so the, tonight is actually an honor for us all to have uh, Professor Dr. Terapong Krajajain. Uh, apologize if I cannot pronounce your name correctly. Uh, and he started his uh, educational journey uh, from uh, 1999, where he got his uh, doctoral in medicine from Mahedol University in Thailand. And he continued in 2002 uh, her, his education uh, as a, in Thai board, board of Clinical Pathology, Mahidol University, Thailand. And in 2003 till 2006, he did his postdoctoral fellow in University of Wisconsin Med Medicine, USA. And for his research of interest, of course, in molecular and clinical micro mycology, microbial pathogenesis and host responses, pityosis and pitium insidiosum. His recent publications are uh, among them are potential anti pitium insidium therapeutic identification through screening of agriculture of fungicides and generation of Protoplast provides a powerful experimental research tool for biological and pathogenicity studies of vitium insidiosum. And comparative genomic analysis reveals gene content diversity, phylogenomic contour, putative virulence, determinate, determinants, and pathologic and potential diagnostic markers within pitidium insidio insidiosum. So without further ado, I uh, ask uh, Professor Terapong to kindly present uh, your slides and uh, share your uh, experience with us. Thank you so much for your uh, kind, uh, very kind introduction. And um, um, uh, thank you also for the chair, uh, the organizer, and all those people who involved in uh, setting up this uh, seminar, including Hana, for inviting me to uh, join this wonderful seminar. So let me have uh, 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 one moment to uh, open my slide. Right. I hope everybody sees the screen. Yes, we've seen it. All right. So um, my topic is about diagnosis and treatment of pityosis. Uh, from the previous session, uh, Hannah already uh, told us about uh, the epidemiology and also the clinical features of this disease. And you can see that um, this disease is something, uh, you know, like life threatening and uh, it seemed to be really difficult to treat. And uh, yeah, um, patients usually have like poor prognosis. Um, the disease endemic in uh, mostly in uh, tropical areas, yeah? like uh, in the, the map that uh, Hannah just showed a moment ago, and uh, like I uh, like she said that uh, the disease has a very high morbidity and mortality. Uh, basically, uh, when you get uh, patients, uh, you can predict that uh, it's going to be a poor prognosis. So, in order to improve prognosis, I think um, the main thing is that you have to uh, make 
uh, diagnosis as early as possible. And there are various ways to, to do that. When you get the diagnosis, then you can uh, step forward to uh, do uh, a treatment, uh, try to uh, do it quick and uh, do it properly. So then uh, that could uh, ensure that patient gonna be, uh, you know, uh, in a position that got uh, good care and have a better uh, prognosis. So um, when a doctor uh, see a patient, um uh, and uh, it uh, uh, and then come up with the uh, definitive diagnosis of ptosis first thing is that they need to uh, you know uh, get information from history and uh, also the physical examination um from there they're gonna maybe suspect that patient uh, may have a clinical feature that look alike ptosis and then they can form idea that okay um maybe uh, they need uh, something to confirm what they think it's uh it it is. So um for the clinical features of ptosis, uh mainly a patient usually present with ocular uh, infection, and uh, some patients uh, uh can present with a vascular infection, like Hannah already described, and. Uh, at the beginning in Thailand, uh, we found just only uh, cases in humans, but just really recent years, uh, there are some uh, cases uh, in animals as well, like in horse and also in dogs. You can see a picture of uh, uh, the animal patients. Um, this look not really good. So um, you can see that uh, the uh, lesion occur in the area that uh, could expose to the uh, habitats of the organism, for example, uh, rice fields or maybe a uh, swampy area. So uh, when you see a clinical feature like this, you may think of uh, ptosis. And then uh, no way that you can make a definitive diagnosis based on just the clinical uh, presentation. You need to um, uh, have a laboratory diagnosis to, to, to prove um, that it is the uh, 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 ptosis. There are uh, several different ways that you can do um, using the uh, uh, laboratory uh, uh, approach. So I list to you that uh, um, there are five different ways. The first, uh, the first is uh, the culture identification, which is the uh, procedure that uh, we can we can perform in general uh, microbiology lab. So we can use the uh, general media to culture the. Uh, the uh, uh, clinical samples, and then uh, see uh, what the organism uh, come up and then try to identify from there, whether it's uh, a PFM or maybe uh, some other uh, 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 organisms. Or we can do uh, the bio biochemical test. Um, I'm gonna uh, uh, go into details in, uh, in just a moment. Or you, you can use the uh, immunodiagnosis, molecular methods, uh, or um, a more uh, recent technology like proteomic detection. And also uh, this is in the, uh, you know, um, you under research uh, using the uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence based technique to help uh, to detect the, the pathogen. I'm gonna go into this uh, just briefly later. So first, for the laboratory, laboratory diagnosis, uh, we can do culture identification. Like I said, that uh, when you got the clinical sample, uh, then you can okay. So you can uh, put the clinical sample on uh, a media like subroid dextrose egg uh, and then uh, let it sit in the incubator, incubator at room temperature or maybe uh, at 37 degrees Celsius for a few days. And then you're gonna see if there is the organism in the clinical sample, you're gonna see the, uh, the uh, morphology like this. Um, the colony not gonna have the aerial hyphae, not gonna have the spore that you can use to differentiate what is the species it is. So it's just flat, round, yeah. and then uh, it's kind of submerged in the media just a little bit. And then you, when you take 
a portion of the colony and look under the microscope, you can see it looks like a fungus. So it's a hyphae, a mycelium, which is right branching. Um, then, and it doesn't seem to have uh, very often uh, the septate uh, in the hyphae. And then um, what makes it different, different from uh, of, uh, the fungi is that it can be induced to produce um, the structure, a special structure called a uh, soil support here. So uh, you can see the tip of the hyphae when it is in the um, uh, um, spatial condition. And then uh, that condition gonna induce um, um, the, the tip of the hyphae to produce uh, something like a sac. And within the sac, it can be cleavage into multiple cells. Uh, each cell called source spore. The source spore has uh, the fascia to help it to swim. So then, uh, you know, um, sometimes we call this kind of uh, organism like of water mold because of it uh, inhabited in a water. And then uh, the source spore uh, that it has been produced by this organism, it can swim too. Now uh, it has a fascia and then it can uh, it try to find a horse like plant water plant or maybe uh, accidental host like animal or maybe human. And then it uh, can uh, proceed for uh, uh, infection to occur. And then uh, this graph show you the uh, optimal temperature that uh, we uh, can use to culture the organism. You can see that uh, the uh, organism is very really sensitive to really low temperature or maybe really high temperature like 42. And then you can see that at these two extreme temp temperatures, the organism cannot go really well. It can go very well at room temperature around uh, 25 to 28 and drop a little bit at 32 and, uh, and a little bit more at 37. So um, this is the lens that we can use to culture the organism. We, if we think of uh, uh, PTF insidiosum, if you um, put it in a uh, clinical sample in the refrigerator, that can that could kill the organism, and then it turned out that you not be able to isolate it from the clinical sample. This is really important. All right. So the second one is the biochemical selectorization. Um, this method has first been reported by um, uh, we were last uh, and her uh, co-workers. Uh, I think uh, this is a good idea to introduce something like this because uh, the biochem bio biochemical tests or biochemical materials uh, have been widely available in microbiology lab. So they use it uh, routinely to uh, identify bacteria uh, from clinical culture. Um, and then um, they apply this and see if they can use uh, this, uh, you know, uh, biochemical selectorization that has been used for uh, bacteria for identifying whether the uh, organism is PPM insidiosum. They reported, they, uh, they reported that uh, maltose and sucrose, when these two substrate uh, have been hydrolyzed, this is uh, an indicator to say that, okay, the uh, organism is PFM insidiosum. Uh, but uh, I have to uh, uh, tell you that uh, they uh, limit uh, the number of isolates, uh, the uh, number of tested isolates to just six isolates. So that's too small. And then um, in my group some years ago, uh, we want to uh, just make sure that this uh, characteristic is, can be applicable for all the strains in our lab. So we started to uh, basically repeat the same um, uh, assay using the similar uh, biochemical test, but this time we use uh, the test again to 26 isolates, which is considered quite a lot. And then we found that, um, you know, if we think that the uh, PTF insidiosum can uh, hydrolyze maltose and sucrose, it's true for most uh, for most uh, strains or isolate around uh, eighty percent, but for uh, uh, some strains about twenty uh, isolate, that is not the case. Some strain uh, it can be hydrolyzed uh, just one, or maybe some strain uh, cannot be able to hydrolyze hydrolyze any of the substrates. So then uh, you can use uh, this biochemical test. Uh, for uh, guiding you that maybe this could be a potentially uh, PTM insidiosum, but it's not absolute. So um, this is kind of a, you have to be aware of. 
Um, the third method is um, about uh, something that are related to uh, detecting antigen or antibody. We call it um, uh, immunodiagnosis. Uh, so um, for uh, antigen detection, um, uh, you know, investigators, some investigators develop, uh, you know, um, antibodies yeah, for staining the organism in the tissue. Uh, we call that uh, uh, assay as the uh, uh, immunohistological staining. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to uh, show you uh, a bit of this technique. But basically, they e extract the protein from the organism and uh, inject it into an animal like rabbit to uh, to let the rabbit uh, produce antibodies again that protein that we injected to. So then uh, we're gonna take the blood sample from the rabbit and then uh, try to separate just the serum. So we call it rabbit anti serum that uh, have the antibodies that can bind to uh, PCM insidiosum antigens. So then we use that serum, rabbit anti serum, to stain the tissue. You know when the when you uh, see the tissue like this, uh, that have like, you know, infection, and then when you uh, stain it with GMS, which is a non-specific staining, you can see, uh, uh, you know, a structure that was similar between Pythium insidiosum and some other filamentous fungi, for example, Aspergillus. So you, non you cannot differentiate among these two organisms using just GMS, which is really non-specific. And then, um, you know, it's going to be really helpful for uh, pathologists that try to differentiate these two organisms by having them uh, the uh, rapid anti serum that can be uh, specifically bind to the organism in the tissue. So you can see that in the uh, sec second column here, um, this is the rapid anti serum. Again, the protein so called uh, CFA, uh, it stands for culture filtrate antigen. Basically, it's a crude antigen. It's a mixture of uh, antigen that extract from the, the organism. And then uh, they have like uh, rabbit serum against these proteins. And then they try to optimize condition and then they can demonstrate that this serum can differentiate PTM insidiosum from the other fungi. So you can see the other fungi cannot be stained, but uh, you can see um, very prominent staining uh, in PTM uh, insidiosum. And uh, this is another type of antigen that they uh, uh, use to uh, uh, produce the rapid anti serum. The same result only stand for uh, PTM insidiosum, but not the other fungi. But, um, you know, this assay has been routinely used in some hospital, including um, uh, the hospital that I'm working in. And uh, we found that, uh, you know, um, some infections, some infectious agent, like you know, some kind of, some uh, some type of fungi, like um, fusarium, uh, can can have cause reactivity with this rapid anti serum. So then, uh, you know, that's going to be a problem because of we need uh, a specific test uh, to be able to uh, give the definitive diagnosis of PTA infection. But if uh, the uh, serum can closely act with the other fungi, so then the specific specificity of the test is you know, not going to be high. So then you have to be aware that uh, there is a possibility that uh, the positive signal can be some other fungi. So this is because of the, um, the antigen that has been used to uh, produce a serum is not uh, that good. Uh, it uh, contains some protein that can be shared with uh, some other fungi. So then uh, the, there is a room for uh, further development to make this test uh, more specific. All right, that's about uh, antigen detection. So I'm going to talk next about the an antibody detection. Uh, in this case, um, when we want to detect the antibody, we need to have a protein that we extract from the organism. Uh, and uh, when we have protein, we can develop various uh, techniques for detecting uh, the antibodies against PPM. So uh, I divide uh, the techniques into three groups, or maybe two uh, so-called uh, generation, first, second, and third. The first generation is the test that has been developed um, you know, at first place when we uh, first, uh, you know, uh, detect the, uh, or maybe uh, uh, when we first file the case, 
And uh, we use a technique that's simple, easy to develop. For example, immunodeficient test. This test is something that you know we can uh, develop uh, in any uh, uh, laboratory, just having uh, the uh, a good extract from the culture, and then uh, make a gel, and then uh, we can uh, perform the, exp uh, the the test by adding uh, the uh, patient serum in and see the precipitation. I'm gonna show you the picture of this test, but it has some uh, limitation. So um, then there's a reason for uh, investigators to develop uh, the second generation. Um, the limitation is the sensitivity for the first gen. So, so the second gen is going to have uh, the technique that increases sensitivity, for example, ELISA or maybe Western blood. But these two techniques is, um, seem to be complicated to, uh, to, uh, to do. So then um, there are some uh, developments to make the diagnosis of the disease easier by uh, introducing a third generation test which is really rapid and user friendly. For example, uh, lateral flow, like we do with the uh, COVID-19, uh, try to detect antigen of the COVID-19 using lateral flow to ICT. Or maybe um, you can use the uh, agglutination assay that's uh, like uh, you try to um, determine your blood group, uh, the same thing. Yeah. So uh, for the first generation assay, uh, this picture show you the immunodeficient test, like I told you, that is easy to uh, produce or and perform. You just uh, try to make a gel like this and make some holes. And then you add PTF antigen in the center and the sur surrounding holes or wells, you can add uh, you know, multiple serums. Uh, in this case, I, uh, um, I uh, label it as a, uh, unknown serum one, two, three, and four. And I also included positive and negative control. At the positive control, you can see that there uh, is a precipitation line because of in positive control, it contains uh, antibody against pithium. And then it when it diffuses through the gel and meet with the uh, pithium institution antigen that we put in the center well, it's gonna, you know, uh, uh, have uh, agglutination, precipitation in the gel, and then we can see it, uh, a white light like this. Now, same thing for serum one. It means that the serum one contains the uh, antipithium insidiosum antibodies, also uh, serum two and four, but not serum three. You cannot see uh, the precipitation light uh, because uh, uh, the serum three uh, does not contain uh, the antibody against the pathogen, right? Um, like I told you that the immunodeficient test has a limitation in a way that uh, is really insensitive assay. So when you cannot detect the precipitation line, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, indicate that the patient doesn't have the infection, but maybe because of uh, the test is to, you know, it's not sensitive enough to detect uh, the uh, the antibody in the patient serum. So, you know, because of it, you, you have to, um, if I go back here, you have to uh, interpret the result by naked eye, try to see the precipitation line. Some Sometimes uh, the precipitation line is really faint and you cannot see it. And uh, this kind of technique is, has uh, a condition called prozone phenomenon where um, when you have a very high level of antibody, it cannot uh, you know, complex well with the antigen. So then the uh, precipitation line not gonna pre uh, you know, show uh, properly. So then um, that's gonna cause a false negative result. So then there are some problems about sensitivity of this assay. Then the second generation uh, has been developed. Uh, in this case, I use uh, we use the uh, ELISA, we develop ELISA to get around with the uh, poor sensitivity. And uh, this is the paper that I uh, first published uh, in 2002 uh, when I started to uh, work on this organism and uh, uh, disease. And you can see that uh, we use a plate and coat the plate with the PTM and antigen uh, put in the serum and then uh, add the secondary, secondary antibody and then you uh, add the substrate. 
the uh, second delivery antibodies, uh, it has enzymes that can, uh, you know, hydrolyze substrate and cause and uh, lead to a color. Yeah. Like in this case, the uh, blue color um, indicate that uh, there is the antibodies, there is a reaction occur. And then the level of the ELISA signal can be measured. And then you can use that level, which is represent uh, the uh, antibody level uh, to monitor the treatment whether after treatment patients, you know, have, uh, you know, has been uh, clear with infection or whether uh, the patients are, uh, may have a recurrent infection. Uh, for the second gen, there is still another um, uh, technique called Western blot. But this technique uh, is very really complicated. You need to uh, separate protein in the gel and then transfer those separated protein onto the membrane and probe it with serum and see the bands, profile of the bands yeah, that compatible with pityosis. You can see the upper panels here, uh, show you that uh, when we uh, have uh, uh, about uh, 14 uh, pityosis sample, you can see the profile the protein appear here. But when you test the, uh, the assay with the uh, control, including donor, uh, which is considered a healthy person, or thalassemic patients, or other uh, patients with other infectious disease, you're not going to see any bands. So then uh, this uh, can uh, be used as a diagnostic test, but again, it's, it's too complex to perform. So then it's not so popular. The third, third gen is going to be a test that easy to perform and rapid. Uh, the first one is a hemagglutination. Basically, you have to prepare a red cell, for example, cheap red cell. And then you try to tap this red cell with PTM antigen. So you have to develop uh, a protocol uh, that can uh, uh, be used to uh, uh, sensitize the, uh, the sheep red cell with the, uh, the PTM antigen. And then you're going to get something like this. You have uh, the PTM antigen on the surface of red cell, and then you can use this red cell to detect antibody in serum. The same way that you uh, do a back grouping testing, um, if uh, you have agglutination like this picture, it means that the pigmentation serum it has um, uh, uh, antibodies against the organism. So then you can make a definitive diagnosis using this assay. But if not, you can see uh, it's gonna you know uh, precipitate into the bottom of the uh, the veil, and then uh, yeah you can say that okay this is uh, 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 reactive or not reactive or negative. Uh, the second technique in the third, third gen is um, uh, uh, called immunochromatography or ICT. Um, you know, it's the same uh, principle like the, uh, um, the uh, lateral flow or ICT that we use for uh, detecting the uh, COVID-19. But in this case, we develop the assay in a way that it can detect antibody, not the antigen. So it seems to be very really simple, but the way to develop this assay is not really uh, easy, it's complex and uh, require a lot of optimal uh, optimizations. And then um, when you test um, a blood sample with this assay, uh, um, uh, you just you know dip uh, this assay into the, the serum sample and see uh, how many bands appear. If you got just one band, which is a control band, then you can say this is negative. Uh, two bands, then it's positive for antibodies. So then you can make a diagnosis based on this result. So um, uh, we uh, try to demonstrate that since we have uh, several assays for uh, detecting antibodies, again, PTM in CDO, so we want to, to know that uh, which assay uh, among, uh, which assay uh, seem to be the best. So we can compare them side by side using the same set of samples. And the result is that uh, we found uh, the uh, ELISA and the ICT have the same uh, efficiency, 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And uh, when uh, you look at the turnaround time, uh, the ICT uh, needs just uh, half an hour. Uh, but for uh, in the uh, ELISA case, you need three hours. Right, so um, the silo diagnostic test that we have developed so far is just for detecting antibody in human patients. But again, um, in this picture that Hannah already showed to you, 
um, the case has been increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, increased, increasingly found uh, all over the, the world uh, in humans and in animals. And uh, in Thailand, we start to uh, see uh, animal cases more and more. So then I, I think that we need to uh, develop uh, the, the assay um, to make it be able to detect the antibodies in animal as well. To do so, uh, we introduced uh, um, the, uh, a new assay by uh, modifying the old assay uh, using uh, the uh, protein AG. We replaced the second, secondary antibodies uh, for detecting anti-PTM in the uh, by using the protein AG. Protein AG is the uh, part of the bacterium that uh, can bind to um, you know, uh, the IgG uh, of uh, various uh, animal species. So then when you uh, tag it with the uh, you know, uh, reporting signal, so you can use it to uh, detect uh, uh, the antibodies in uh, humans and also animals in just one test. So uh, we uh, modify the uh, ICT, the old ICT by adding the protein AG, and then we can use it to uh, detect uh, the uh, uh, disease in uh, humans and animals. To evaluate this assay, uh, we collaborate with a uh, um, uh, group of researchers who are interested in uh, uh, pityosis in Brazil and also in the United States of America. We got some um, samples from humans and also animals and uh, a number of control samples. And uh, we compare uh, the ICT that based on the protein AG with the Eli ELISA, found that uh, uh, both tests uh, show uh, the same uh, uh, specificity. But for the ICT, it show uh, slightly lower uh, sensitivity. But you know, 91% uh, seem to be uh, good enough for you to use, uh, helping you to uh, uh, make that making diagnosis of pityosis. So uh, not just only the ICT, we also modify the ELISA assay uh, to be able to detect the antibody uh, in both uh, humans and also animals patients. So uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, if you use the, uh, um, the uh, ELISA that uh, specifically detect just uh, uh, human IgG, um, when you use the uh, serum from uh, animal, it's not going to detect well. Uh, you can see uh, some dots uh, uh, below the cutoff. Uh, uh, most of them uh, came from uh, animals. But when you modify the assay using the protein AG, then uh, the, uh, the samples can be, um, you know, uh, uh, can be from humans or animals. Right. Um, we use this regularly in the laboratory. Uh, in our hospital and uh, some other hospital as well. And like I uh, told you that uh, uh, animal case has been increase increasingly uh, uh, found in Thailand. And, uh, you know, veterinarians uh, used uh, the ICT that we have developed to detect uh, 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 the uh, PTF insidiosum in animal serums. But um, when we uh, use this more and more, we found that there are some cases that proven to, proven to be, um, you know, uh, other fungal infection. For example, uh, basidiobolus uh, lana loom infection that can, uh, you know, give you cross reactivity with the ICT that we developed for uh, detecting uh, antibody for PTM insidiosum. So then um, this showed to, to us that um, the, uh, the test is not uh, specific enough to uh, detect the PTAP insidiosum. So then, uh, yeah, we need to uh, do something uh, to increase the uh, specificity of this test. So uh, there are some room for doing research to develop a better test. At this point, I think that um, we need uh, a more specific protein uh, to develop a test for detecting antibodies. And also we need uh, a more specific antibodies to develop immunoassay for detecting, uh, for specifically detecting uh, PTM in the tissue. So just to show you that we started to uh, try to identify uh, specific proteins that we can use to develop a better diagnostic. Uh, in this case, we started from 
um, some time ago in 2006, we uh, did a really simple assay called Western blot. And uh, we separate, uh, we prepare our crude extract from various strain of PTM, and then we probe it with the uh, serum from, from patient with pityosis and identify which protein that uh, could be potentially share uh, immunoreactive proteins for PTM insidiosis. And we found that uh, there are one, there is one protein at the uh, 20, uh, 74 kilo Dalton that seem to be reactive across all the strain tested. So then we become interested in this protein. And later on, uh, we use some kind of molecular techniques and we, 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 were, be, uh, we were able to identify that protein as XO13 beta glucanase. And we can uh, you know, um, try to see its function. Uh, it uh, contains the glycosyhydrase uh, activity like the glucanase should have and it seems like to be uh, uh, temp temperature regulated. It up regulated when uh, the organism exposed to high temperature like body temperature. So then uh, it somehow it could be uh, associated with the pathogenesis as well because of its uh, temperature regulated. And then uh, later on, we try to clone and express to get the recombinant protein out of this. And we, are, we have been successfully um, you know, produce this protein as uh, the uh, recombinant protein. And then, uh, yeah, we can apply or adapt this protein in the future for making a better diagnostic. But not just a uh, uh, glucanase protein, uh, we try to identify more proteins that uh, have the same property, which is the immunoreactive and specific to the organism, PTM insidiosum. So we use the uh, approach called cell-free protein synthesis. And then um, we uh, take advantage of having the genome sequence, uh, try to identify some genes that could potentially uh, be uh, translated into uh, immunoreactive proteins. We uh, produce uh, protein out of those uh, you know, uh, selected genes uh, using the cell-free protein synthesis and validate it against uh, a set of serum and we can identify another protein called IO6 protein using this technique. You can see the structure of it um, uh, diagram to show your functional unit of this protein. And then uh, this is the Western blot to show that it's an uh, uh, immunoreactive protein at about 60 kilo Dalton. And when you test it against a set of uh, PTOC serum, it's very reactive but not for control serum from uh, you know, healthy person or other infectious disease. So then this is another uh, candidate for future development for a diagnostic test, a better diagnostic test. Um, you can see here, upper panel, uh, we uh, did the uh, Western blood analysis. We separated the crude extract, uh, uh, CFA, and then we probe it with the uh, a multiple sample from pityosis and also a patient with uh, basic deoboras infection. And I told you that, uh, you know, uh, serum from a uh, patient with basic deoboras infection could cross-react with uh, PTM antigen, which we use uh, for developing the test. You can see the, the arrows here to indicate which uh, protein of PTM insidiosum can be uh, cross-react with uh, serum from uh, this patient. So then um, we test the IO6. We cannot see the cost reaction with the basic dura serum. So then it seemed to us that the IO6 is a good protein for, uh, 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 for uh, being a uh, diagnostic markers. All right, for uh, the antigen detection, uh, we try several approach. Uh, try to uh, identify uh, uh, by the proteins, by the molecules like uh, S, uh, SCFV, which is single chain variable fragment, is a portion of the antibodies, just only the binding site. Um, we try to develop Aptoma, we try to develop the monoclonal antibody, but so far uh, the promising uh, binding molecule is the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we uh, develop it uh, from the, uh, the hybridoma that we got from mice. And then it generates uh, a clone of monoclonal antibodies that can bind nicely at the surface of the pathogens. You can see um, um, the green il illumination on the surface of the hyphae. 
So then uh, you can say that, okay, this can be used as uh, markers uh, for uh, staining assay. And since it's uh, monoclonal antibodies, so then uh, we can produce it unlimitedly. And then uh, the quality control is gonna be better than uh, having the rapid anti-serum. Right, so uh, move to um, the another assay, molecular assay. So uh, recently we just uh, did a systematic review on uh, you know, what assay that has been developed for uh, detecting uh, the uh, uh, nucleic acid uh, of the uh, organism. So we can divide uh, the techniques into two groups. The first one is non-amplification technology based on the hybridization, which is not popular because of it uh, requires a radioactive substance. The second group is amplification technology, which can be sub uh, divided into three groups. The first one is PCR-based techniques which includes uh, sequencing, uh, sequence homology analysis, conventional PCR, nested PCR, multiple PCR, and real-time PCR. Oh, uh, the second group is the isotomal amplification. You may heard of the LAM assay, right? Or maybe HDA, which is the assay that can use just for a single temperature. Unlike for the uh, PCR, that you need to have a circle of different temperature to amplify the target uh, uh, DNA. But for the isothermal amplification, you just need a single temperature, which is uh, will be really helpful when you don't have the uh, PCR matching. You just use the incubator at uh, a certain temperature to perform this assay. The third group rely on the next generation sequencing. So uh, this is kind of a expensive assay. And then when you have like a clinical sample, you just put um, you try to amplify everything from there and see you can, uh, if the amplified uh, DNA from there contains something that is similar to PTIP in also, right? So you can use this technique as well. Right, so um, when you try to develop uh, the molecular assay, you need to have uh, a good markers or a, a good target. Uh, in general, uh, ribosomal DNA repeats, which is, I show you this, this structure here, contains uh, 18S ribosomal RNA, ITS1, 5.8 ribosomal RNA, ITS2, and 28, uh, 28AS RNA. So this is a structure that has been re repeated um, in, the, in the genome many times. So basically it has uh, multiple copies. Then it's a good thing because of uh, it's gonna increase your chance to amplify this target because of its multiple copies. And um, uh, not just for PTIP in Cirosum, many, many uh, other organisms, they also decide uh, so-called primers uh, that uh, try to amplify or detect these regions as well. So then um, the uh, ribosomal DNA or uh, uh, RDNA repeats is a common target because of it uh, is a well exhibit. It has a well exhibit database of various uh, from various of species in the NCBI database. And it's um, with it itself, it's had a sequence that, uh, you know, homogeneity enough to differentiate uh, at the species, uh, species level. So then uh, these good uh, uh, things or uh, properties of these target genes make you make it a popular target uh, sequence for designing uh, or making or developing the molecular tests. So I like to give you some example of the technique that people uh, uh, use to develop the assay to detect the PTIP in situ DNA. The first one is the uh, sequence homology analysis. So basically uh, you extract DNA from uh, uh, the, the clinical uh, samples or maybe the, the culture of the organism that you want to identify it. You get the genomic DNA, you have uh, the uh, so-called fungal universal primers to amplify uh, the DNA from that uh, extract genomic DNA. And then you're gonna get, you know, uh, kind of a, a fragments that you need to submit it for sequencing. And then when you get sequence, you have to blast search against uh, the database 
uh, in the in, in uh, NCBI, for example, in the gene banks, for example, to see if you know the uh, sequence that you amplify has a similarity against what organism. So then, if you have like maybe uh, at least ninety eight point five percent, so then uh, you can say that okay, that can be uh, PTF incidosum that it uh, if uh, the percent similarity is at least. 98.5% with the left friend PTF incidosum in the database. This is the uh, technique that widely used because of, uh, you know, you just have universal fungal primers. And then uh, if you can access to the uh, sequencing facility, so then you can do this assay. The second one is the uh, conventional PCR and also the nested PCR. Basically, you need to decide the specific primers to amplify, specifically amplify the target sequence in the extracted DNA. And then you run it on the gel to observe the expected size. So um, it's have a high sensitivity and specificity. And but it require a PCR matching, which is kind of expensive. Not every laboratory, especially in rural area, has this. The next one is the uh, multiplex PCR. Uh, the good, uh, actually, the principle is similar to the con conventional PCR, uh, but it uh, the but the difference is this technique can detect multiple targets. And then other than, um, for PTM incidosum, other than detecting the organism, it can genotype the organism into uh, several different clades. So then it's gonna be useful for, uh, you know, uh, epidemiological study. Next one is real-time PCR. So um, these techniques is gonna be something that uh, you can quantify the amount of DNA, uh, how much it is when you first uh, uh, test it. And it's really fast compared to conventional PCR. Right. So um, the, the assay that I just mentioned to you, the first four, uh, they require PCR machines. So um, you need to uh, um, set a reaction uh, uh, with uh, several different uh, temperatures to be able to amplify the target DNA. But for LAM assay, this assay, we stand for loop mediated isothermal amplification. Uh, you just need one temperature, for example, 55 uh, or 50 uh, degrees Celsius that you can achieve by using the uh, heat block. And then uh, it's gonna be uh, easier or maybe uh, feasible for you to perform in, uh, you know, in general laboratory. But the, the problem with this essay is that uh, you can uh, you have to decide a complex set of primers, uh, maybe four, uh, four different primers or maybe six different primers, which is not easy to decide. And then another thing is that uh, it's really sensitive and then it can cause uh, carry over and make it have like four positive result. It can be, uh, you know, uh, generate uh, a lot of uh, floating around DNA in the laboratory and it make everything positive, even though uh, you use just water. So then uh, you have to be really well trained and have experience in handle um, uh, the ex uh, uh, this assay when you uh, want to perform this, just to uh, prevent uh, the carryover and for positive result. But the good thing for this assay is it's simple and it use just one temperature, like I told you. All right, so um, the next assay is rely on the prote proteomic assay. Uh, this is not routinely, yet, uh, as, uh, uh, routinely used yet. Uh, it's just recently developed, but basically it just uh, try to see the uh, proteomic profile or protein profile of the organism. So we need to have a database of the uh, uh, proteins of the organism, and then uh, we generate the unknown sample and compare the unknown uh, a profile from the unknown sample against the database in order for you to identify the organism. But uh, this technique is really popular for identification of bacteria and also some kind of yeast, but not uh, other organism yet. 
Right. For um, the last one is the deep learning or AI-based detection. So basically, we need to develop a, a software uh, to make it uh, learn how to uh, you know, detect in details about you know, clinical features. Uh, you want to use uh, you know, that software to help you to be like ophthalmologist, for example, to see that, okay, this uh, lesion look like um, uh, 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 pithium colitis, something like that. So then uh, basically uh, we develop program that could be potentially replaced uh, the ophthalmologist by taking pictures and then this software gonna incorporate that, um, uh, analyze that picture against the database of various uh, cases and then come up with the percentage of possibility how likely that picture is going to be from patient with uh, ocular infection. And also we can develop the assay that uh, to uh, try to differentiate the morphology, for example, the colony morphology. You know, uh, I think um, when it's come down to identification of the uh, organism in laboratory, it's going to be something that requires a lot of experiences and maybe a lot of, you know, assays. But we try to make it simple by asking a software to learn how, um, you know, PPM can be differentiated from uh, the other organisms based on just morphology. And um, we got a preliminary data to show that um, it can be, you know, as high as 90% accuracy for uh, just tell us that, okay, this colony come from PPM insidiosum or not. So then uh, we hope that uh, in the near future, we can report this and then, um, you know, uh, we can use it in the routine uh, laboratory for screening the colony. All right, so uh, there are a lot of options in terms of laboratory diagnostic test and uh, what test we should use. So uh, there are something to consider, um, you know, what test you choose use, maybe it depends on, you know, availability of the test or equipment, you know, like ICT, you cannot develop it yourself. You need to have it from somewhere. So the problem is, can you have that? So, uh, or maybe you want to develop the PCR assay. So you need to have a machine. Do you have that? If you have, so you can start to develop it. And then um, you need to uh, know about the uh, test efficiency too. Uh, you know, um, you need to uh, develop or use the test that uh, has high sensitivity and specificity, right? You know, to, uh, to uh, accurately uh, detect the organism. So then this is uh, one factor that uh, you have to consider about which test you should pick. And also the skill and experiences. Uh, uh, the, uh, the obvious case is for the LAM assay. It's easy to get contaminated and you can get, uh, you know, four positive results easily. All right, so um, these are six different uh, diagnostic tests that we can use in laboratory for detecting PTAP insidiosum. Uh, for the uh, practical tests that we use in routine um, here and some other uh, laboratories, um, they are the, the test that we use are the uh, culture identification. We need to um, uh, induce wall spore. And uh, we uh, usually use the uh, immunodiagnostic test, especially uh, ICT or ELISA for detecting an antibodies. And uh, we also use the molecular assay. Uh, we use the uh, sequence homology, which is uh, simple. And uh, I think um, if you can do PCR, then you can do this test. And also the multiple PCR, because of we need not only just uh, identify the organism, but we need to genotype it as well. So then uh, these are tests that we are uh, routinely used in our laboratory. But again, uh, it depends on uh, uh, some factors uh, for the test that you're going to pick, like I told you. Right, so that's all is, uh, about the diagnosis. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly about the treatment. So there are several ways for treatment. First, uh, we can use uh, the antimicrobial agents or drugs. Second, uh, we can uh, have the uh, surgical in intervention. 
Uh, third, uh, we can do uh, the uh, immunotherapy. So, um, you know, based on our experience and, you know, um, literature review, um, we found that the uh, most of the uh, uh, antimicrobial agents are not effective against the organism, PTM insidiosum. And the main treatment option, it, tu it turned out to be a radical surgery, which is try to, uh, you know, remove all infected tissue in order to, you know, uh, uh, make the patient kill. You have to remove all the infected tissue because of you cannot use the anti-microbial uh, agents to uh, uh, el eliminate the organisms. And, um, you know, um, some cases, uh, the doctors uh, apply the uh, immunotherapy. The immunotherapy is the, uh, the way that pe uh, uh, the, pe the, the doctor use the uh, extracted protein from the organism and introduce that into the patients. And somehow that procedure uh, uh, generated the uh, immunity that can, you know, uh, fight against the organism. But uh, from the uh, data that we have from literature review, um, it's not really effective. Just uh, some cases that have a beneficial uh, from uh, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, but just in general, uh, a patient usually have uh, more than one uh, type of treatment. Uh, basically, they uh, have a combination uh, of the uh, antimicrobial agent surgery and uh, immunotherapy. Uh, this slide shows you uh, the uh, mechanism of drug resistance, why uh, most uh, antifungal or ant uh, antimicrobial agents uh, did not work for uh, treatment of pityosis. If you would see the phylogenetic tree here, uh, it uh, represents the, uh, you know, uh, the tree of life. So you can see uh, the uh, blue stars here. Uh, represent the fungi. Yeah. There are various type fungi over here, and you can see animal is here in uh, on the node B, and the uh, plants on the node C, together with the omysis, which uh, Pithium insidiosum is a, men a member of. So then you can see the uh, Pithium insidiosum. Also, it has uh, morphology looks similar to fungi, but phylogenetic tree place it far away from uh, the fungi. Then uh, the drug that decide to use the, for treating or combating the fungi, you know, you can guess that maybe it's not working well because of uh, the organism, uh, the fungi and omysis, including pithium and sinusum, are not really closely related. And we uh, perform some experiments to uh, demonstrate that why antifungal drugs not working well. Because, um, you know, the uh, many antifungal drugs inhibit the enzymes in the pathway called sterol biosynthesis pathway, like uh, terbinafine inhibit the EIG1, itraconosol inhibit the EIG11. So we have genome sequence and we try to uh, uh, find out uh, about uh, the uh, this pathway in PTF insidiosum, we found that the, uh, the organism doesn't have a complete pathway. So then it lacks the enzyme that can be a target of the antifungal drugs. So this explains why antifungal drugs are not working well for PTF insidiosum. So since the drug is not working well, then the main option is surgical intervention, try to remove all infected tissue, aim to be aim to kill. Yeah. So you can see the result of surgical in intervention when you want to remove all infected tissue. If a patient has vascular infection like this, and this patient unlucky enough to have both legs infected, so then it turned out that to control infection, patient has have their legs amputated both sides. And then um, a review some years ago in 2006, we found that a uh, patient with vascular infection, around 80% have leg amputated and around 40% uh, 
they are they were dead from infection. For the ocular infection, um, uh, around eighty percent uh, of patients have their eye removed just to control the infection, not going beyond the eye. For the recent review in the last year, um, we found that the mortality rate of patients with uh, vascular infection decreased uh, over time uh, from 40% to 27%. And uh, when we look into the uh, surgical intervention, focusing on just vascular and ocular pityosis, we found that um, the rate of amputation is still high and even higher compared to the, the previous uh, review, which is 80%. This is close to 90%. This is because of maybe a clinician, um, you know, early detect and try to aggressively uh, control the infection by uh, uh, perform the uh, radical, uh, radical surgery just to uh, make sure that uh, the patient is free of the infection. And then uh, you can see the mortality rate is decreased too because of, uh, you know, uh, maybe um, uh, because of the aggressive treatment. And I remove it reduced from 80% to 44%. Maybe this is because of, uh, you know, more ophthalmologists, more doctors know about this disease. They can early detect. And also we have, uh, um, you know, like a diagnostic test, a better diagnostic test that uh, sensitive enough for early detection. And then um, patient have early, uh, early treatment and then they have a, a better prognosis, right, compared to the previous uh, review. Uh, the next treatment is the immunotherapy. Like I told you that uh, for natural uh, for natural infection, so all spore attached to host and then it germinate as hyphae and it, it trigger uh, immune response, so-called T helper to respond in somehow. And then this immune response is not protective. It just, you know, can stay with the organism really well. But uh, when you uh, extract the protein from the hyphae and introduce that protein into uh, patients, in somehow it trigger immune response called T helper one, which consists of uh, 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 cell mediated components that can get rid of the organism. This is the proposed mechanism of the immunotherapy. When we uh, observe uh, a number of cases that have benefit from using this kind of therapy. And then we can see that, um, um, I give you some example that uh, to demonstrate that uh, the immunotherapy has some benefit to the patients. If we uh, see the uh, final um, output, uh, final result as dead for vascular pityosis patients, if uh, they are not immunized with the vaccine or they are not, um, you know, use the uh, immunotherapy, forty-one percent dead. But um, the group that have uh, uh, immunotherapy, it seemed to have a twofold reduced from 41 to 19%. Similarly in uh, animal, in horse with cutaneous pityosis, uh, we found that, um, you know, if without uh, immunotherapy, 75% need surgery, but uh, the need for surgery reduced by t trams uh, in horse that uh, were treated with immunotherapy. So this to show you that immunotherapy somehow can, you know, uh, reduce more uh, morbidity and mortality of the disease. All right, so uh, if you want to get some more information about uh, the treatments um, uh, for the uh, antimicrobial drugs that, you know, have been tested and used for treating the pityosis, you can uh, go into this review and also uh, for the immunotherapy, uh, you can uh, go into this review. All right, uh, this is, I guess this is my uh, last slide. Sorry if I uh, take too much time. Um, pityosis is endemic disease in tropical areas, it, and it has a uh, very high morbidity and mortality. Patients usually have poor prognosis. We want to improve prognosis. We need to have early de uh, detection of the disease and immediately apply uh, 
proper treatment to the patients and perhaps very aggressive treatment just uh, to uh, kill the patient and reduce the mor morbidity. There are some room for development for a better diagnostic and uh, treatment for pityosis. Right. With that, uh, I'd like to thank for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Terapong. Uh, so, uh, very interesting. And I do learn a lot from your presentations. A lot of information I've gained from your uh, presentation. And me, myself, have uh, actually have a couple of questions. Very interesting in the, uh, I think, uh, uh, sort of like a couple of slides, your end slide, where you present that immune response to the pityosis it actually is a type 2 immune response. Right. Am I correct, Prof? Right. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so because then it is similar to the helmet infection where they right. uh, 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 primarily uh, derive a T helper right. uh, or type 2 immune response. But maybe, uh, could you maybe explain what is specific about these infections that can differentiate the type 2 immune response uh, compared to the helmet infection, for example? Well, um, you know, a lot of things we still don't know about, especially um, the host side, that how hosts yeah. uh, respond to the infection and why you know, um, the type two uh, response is uh, is the uh, natural response type of immunity against the organism. It's similar to like helminth that you mentioned, but we still don't know. And it's gonna be open question for people who are interested in this and try to investigate into in uh, deeply into the details on how or what the mechanism that, you know, uh, is responsible for you know this uh, this observation why type two is dominate in this kind of infection is that similar or different from the same response type two response in helminths in parasites we don't know and uh, why yeah. uh, the vaccine which is used the protein that extract from the pathogen but in different form. It can be able to, you know, trigger, you know, a different, you know, side of immune response, right? T T herbal yeah. one, and it turned yeah. out to be T herbal one is, you know, very effective in terms of, you know, eliminating the organism. So this is still, uh, you know, uh, an open question for for us to try to investigate into, and then uh, maybe uh, if we can. Uh, get more information about this, especially from the host side, so then we can uh, better understand, and then we have uh, you know a bit a better way of control, or maybe uh, we can yeah. develop a better you know uh, immunotherapy, uh, therapeutic vaccine for uh, you know treatment of this disease. Or prof, maybe do you think it's related or correlated with the stage of infection stage of uh yeah stage of infection if it's a chronic infection or if it's a acute infection uh, and which with a specific immune response in that stage i mean well as far as i know um you know for uh ocular infection ocular infection patient usually uh, present very really very really quick, like several days, maybe just one or two weeks. It's really quick. It's maybe considered a key infection. And uh, you cannot see any uh, immune response at the eye because of it is the immunopyrrolate site. It occurs at the uh, cornea, which not uh, have uh, not uh, of uh, very immune cells present there. So then, um, you know, it doesn't seem to have, you know, a lot of immune response at, uh, you know, at the uh, ocular side of infection. Mm. But for the vascular infection, pa patients usually present, uh, you know, sometime longer. For example, two or three months after they first notice the infection. And usually uh, when we investigate into the infected tissue, that, you know, represents chronic infection. 
uh, where you can see a lot of you know uh, eosinophils fields and uh, you know uh, phagocytes like uh, neutrophil and some kind of cytokine set that you know all of these uh, are compatible with the type two immune response. So then, uh, yeah. So for the uh, uh, this infection, it can present like acute infection for the ocular infection, ocular pitosis, or maybe chronic infection. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't have information about the uh, stage of infection at the early mm -hmm. stage, right after, uh, you know, infection, and then it, you know, become developed into, mm -hmm. you know, infection at the early stage, like acute infection and turn into a chronic infection. Maybe if in the near future, if we can develop an animal model, and then uh, we introduce the, the, uh, the pathogen in the animal model, and then we try to, you know, do time cost analysis mm. from the beginning and see, you know, the development of the infection and also from the host side, mm. right, immune response, how it developed, yeah. what the picture of immune response from the beginning to, you know, at the end stage. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you for, for uh, the explanation. And uh, uh, also, I want to know, are there any uh, predi uh, predisposition of this infection? For yeah. example, if uh, somebody with, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm just mentioning, right. maybe a person with the helmet infection will be more susceptible to this infection or right. people, for example, with a certain comorbidity will be more susceptible for this infection. Do you right. have any information about that? Right. Yeah. I, yes, I do. Uh, actually, uh, we thought that the PTM insidiosum may not infect or uh, and cause infection or disease in every body, in every people. Uh, the reason I told you this is that um, we found, for example, in patients with uh, vascular infection, almost all of them have an hematological underlying disease, mostly mm -hmm. thalassemia. All right. More is thalassemia. Oh, interesting. That is for vascular infection, vascular infection. But for ocular infection, you know, uh, we checked the, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a underlying disease for uh, the patients. We found that, you know, doesn't seem to associate, associate with any kind of underlying disease. So it means that most of the patient were healthy, like us. So we have, like, the patient has no underlying disease, but they just got infected, right? That is for ocular infection. When, uh, you know, a person come into contact with water or maybe uh, dirt that contaminated with the organism, they can get infected. And then, you know, present with the clinical feature similar to the ocular pityosis. But for vascular infection, again, uh, it seems like a patient required to have some kind of hematological underlying disease, especially thalassemia. And if you ask why thalassemia, no one knows that yet. No one knows yet. Maybe, uh, but there's uh, uh, some people try to, uh, you know, um, investigate into this because, you know, thalassemia seem to associate with uh, some other uh, infectious disease as well, like uh, malaria or some other pathogens. Um, yeah. You know, is there any uh, uh, something that has been impaired in terms of uh, immune response? And it turned out that there are uh, some cert uh, certain type of immunity that got impaired. You know, uh, there are some review on this, but uh, you know, I don't. I'm not sure which which type of immune impairments that you know responsible for uh, pityosis susceptibility. Yeah, so we need to you know investigate into this, and if we understand why, so then we can you know have a, a better measure to control or maybe prevent infection for those who are very susceptible. 
Yeah, very interesting, Prof. Because I just think that uh, in 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 our faculty, in our uh, yeah, in our fac medical faculty, actually, we have a. Uh, uh researchers who also actually working on thalassemia and i think she is soon uh doing screening on uh, thalassemia so i think it's one of the option where we also can doing uh, can do right. some serological screening right, for right. the pityosis and i think right. it's very very promising all right uh prof and dr hana we have here some question from the audience here, thank you, Prof. Uh, Tirapong and Dr. Hana, for your presentation. This is uh, Gail uh, writing, one of our medical students in Atmajaya. He would like to ask about one: Do you do we have a vaccine against this pathogen? Do do to its poor prognosis if not detect and uh, treat it early? And what specific antigen for the vaccine? Second question from him about the resistance of the drug. Can you explain a little bit more how this mechanism works? Are we any closer to the certain microbial to kill or inhibit this pathogen's growth? Maybe, uh, yeah, Prof or uh, Dr. Hannah, who want to start first? Yeah, I guess that uh, this is better for Hana to answer this because of uh, she did a nice review on immunotherapy vaccine. Yeah, please, Dr. Hana. Uh, I think uh, I, I I will read a question first. Is that a particular reason why we suspect the eye and vasculature system? Just this point. Yes, I think for the question number one, it's like similar to uh, Professor Tirapong have explained that uh, about the about the uh, eyes, I has a, a like a different immune response with the vascularization. I think it's for the number one is similar with Professor Tirapong have explained. Mm. <clears throat> I think for the number two, the, the current treatment, the current main type, uh, I think I want to, uh, I, I'm sorry. Yes, I think it's similar with the Professor Tirapo have explained that uh, in Ocular fetiosis, ocular fetiosis in uh, is like a close, uh, a close side that maybe is difficult for the like immune cells to to come to the care, uh, cornea. So uh, usually, patient with a uh, keratitis fetiosis, uh, if we inject with the immunotherapy, it doesn't have any. Any in, any effect or any improvement, and it is different with the uh, vascular fetiosis. Is number one, I think. And the number two, what is the current main diagnosis of choice in parents? Uh, I think it has explained with uh, Professor Tirabong about the serology and the PCR. Uh, ICT in serology is ICT and ELISA and PCR. Uh, with the uh, ITS, I think that uh, for the question for the other question about the risk risk factors that a person might get fetiosis, uh, this is a uh, risk factor. Uh, the first one is about the thalassemic in vascular fetiosis, and the second one in ocular fetiosis is about the ocular injury that usually patient had a. Uh, stick with the trauma or contact with the fresh stagnant water. Okay, that's all my my answer to Maria. Okay, thank you, Doc. Do you want to add something, Prof. Uh, Tirapong? Sure. Um, when we say something about vaccine, we usually mean uh, to prevent or prophylaxis of uh, a certain disease of interest. Like you know, COVID nineteen, we have a vaccine 
just to prevent us from getting infected, right? For that sense, for PTM insidiosum, you know, uh, there are some kind of uh, ex um, studies that try to see if you can use the uh, PTM antigen to immunize a protective immunity against or prevent in the, the, the future infection. It turned out that it cannot. It cannot. And uh, there are some uh, animal cases that, you know, has been immunized with the uh, the vaccine. Uh, usually, uh, we not gonna use the term vaccine because you know it's gonna uh, represent something about prevention. Um, usually, we gonna use like um, for example, immunotherapeutic antigens or proteins. Uh, you know, and uh, for use is for uh, immunotherapeutic purpose. We are not going to use this vaccine because of some data show that this protein cannot be used as a vaccine to prevent the infection. And uh, animal ha that has been immunized with this protein, it cannot prevent the second infection. You know, the second infection still occur after, you know, getting uh, immunotherapy, right? So then, um, to answer the question, uh, we, we don't have vaccine for this. So we cannot, you know, prevent the infection uh, by using this kind of uh, uh, method. And uh, uh, if you're asking about the specific antigen for the vaccine, uh, in this case, I'd like to, you know, maybe change your question a little bit to uh, specific uh, antigen for thermotic protein, uh, thermotic Thera uh, immunotherapy, I'm sorry, specific antigen for immunotherapy. Yeah. I think uh, I propose some, a few proteins. Uh, one of them is uh, glucanase protein that we have already cloned and expressed. And the second one is the IO6 protein that we found. We found out that these proteins are specific to the pathogens and also it, um, you know, it's very immunoreactive. And then, Maybe we can use this protein for enrich uh, the uh, immunoreactive immunoreactivity of the 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 the, uh, the immunotherapy. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I confuse you this, but uh, um, again, uh, we don't have vaccine, and if we're talking about immunotherapy, we can improve it by enriching it with. Uh, some kind of the uh, immunoreactive proteins, in this case, glucanase and L6 protein that we recently identified. All right, and then the second uh, question um, asking about the resistance of the drug. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I show you once one of my slides to show you the um, mechanism of drug resistance. In that slide, showing the, you the, uh, you know, the PTM insidiosum lacks or doesn't, doesn't have the pathway or complete pathway of ergosterol biotidesis. So this pathway, ergosterol biosynthesis, contains enzymes that consider as the target of the conventional uh, trifungal drugs. Since PTM insidiosum doesn't have this pathway and also some enzymes that can be a target of those you know, and try fungal drugs. So then, you know, this drug, you can expect that it's not going to be effective against the organism, right? So then uh, this is my explanation for, you know, the mechanism of, of, of action of the anti fungal drugs, why it's not effective. And uh, you're asking more about, um, you know, how closer we are to get you know, a certain antimicrobial drugs to inhibit the, the pathogen. You know, um, you know, Hana did um, uh, a very extensive review on you know, uh, various antimicrobial drugs. And it turned out that a uh, very few of them seem to be effective, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not a currency that is gonna be effective for every case, just some case that you know, has to be reported. And uh, in our experiences, uh, we did not find uh, any uh, single anti 
anti uh, antimicrobial drugs that can be used to control infection. So then, uh, still we still need to uh, find a new drugs, and the approach that we have, have uh, has been using is uh, we use the uh, uh, the strategy called uh, the uh, drug repurposing. So it means that uh, we try to find the drugs that has been developed uh, for other disease, like maybe the drug that has been used for DM diabetes, right? And then uh, maybe uh, if we uh, try to see if that drug can inhibit somehow the organism PTM insidiosum, we can use that drugs for treatment of pityosis too. But we have plenty of drugs out there and then we need to have um, a pipeline that we can screen through all of those drugs to find tune or maybe narrow down to a set of a smaller set of drugs that can be used for this purpose. Kill the PTM insidiosum. You know, Hannah did this as a part of her thesis. Uh, she used the uh, bioformatic analysis um, to analyze the uh, proteins that uh, present in PTM insidiosum. And then uh, using the program, somehow some kind of program that uh, can um, take uh, a potential proteins of PTM insidiosum, and then use that to docking or binding assay against all possible chemicals, including approved drugs in the markets. Né? Um, you know, this is this has to be done in you know, in in uh, computer software. Use computer software try to uh, see the binding affinity of the uh, PTM protein and uh, all the uh, you know approved drugs. And uh, Hannah can narrow down some kind of drugs uh, to a handful, and then uh, she can uh, identify some. For example, um, Viagra. Do you know Viagra? Uh, this is a drug that uh, has been used for, you know, electrical dysfunction. It, it turned out that this, uh, you know, drugs, Viagra, can effectively inhibit the organism to some extent. So then this is interesting because of, uh, it means that maybe we can use Viagra, for example, for, you know, inhibiting the organism, right? So then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not, useful just for electrical dysfunction anymore. It can be useful for, you know, being an anti-PTM insidiosum agents too. But Viagra is not only one that, you know, we identify. We, uh, we found some other drugs as well. But we in the process of validating, you know, whether which one is actually useful or actually effective against the organism. And then this is going to be a first step uh, doing it in repertory, and then we get more information. We can step forward for uh, testing it in the animal model to see, you know, if it can be useful. Right. I hope yeah. I answer your question. Yeah, I know. We found a lot of uh, still unanswered question from uh, this discussion, uh, yeah. and. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions still, Prof, in the chat box. And because of we have a very limited uh, time, I do want to ask a vinyl question. And I think this is very important for us to also understand about this disease is right. why I and why um, uh, vascular systems Right. That can that being a favorite target of right. this organism. Do you have any explanation for that? Right. So, uh, you know, um, you ask a question that no one can answer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. Again. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, a lot of things we don't know about this disease. You know, um, if you're asking about a specific site of infection, like eyes and artery, for example, for yeah. PTM insidious infection. So, it's the same thing for the other organism that it prefer some some organism not all that it prefer specific tissue or organs right for like hepatitis b virus is to prefer to infect hepato hepatocytes and uh, maybe aspergillus it prefer to go to the lung and the cryptococcus neoformin which is um this it prefer to 
go to the lung and go to the uh, the brain, for example. So it must it must be something about receptor and its ligand, you know. Mm. You know, maybe the organism has something that really well compatible with you know, uh, kind of a protein that express just only in the eye, or I mean, maybe just only at the uh, you know endothelium of the artery, for example. So then, you know, this can be a hypothesis, uh, you know, kind of a hypothesis to explain why uh, the eye and the artery are the, uh, you know, the target size of the organism. And then, you know, we can design experiment to test this. Uh, we can extract some kind of proteins, surface protein of the, uh, you know, corneal cells or maybe uh, endotheliums, and then try to see if uh, that can, you know, recruit or maybe better buy to organism compared to when we use the, uh, you know, a protein from the assertive cell types, for example. So no one knows why. Yeah, okay, thank you, Prof. And I think the animal models will, will really, yeah. really help about right. the, uh, us to understand the mechanisms, why this and why that. Right. Yeah. And thank you very much, uh, Prof. Terapong and Dr. Hana. We really do hope that we can have another session where we can uh, uh, discuss these things more uh, specific and get more information about your further research. I'm sure Dr. Hana also in Indonesia to some extent also uh, doing research in uh, pityosis. Right. And uh, and with this, I would like to end the uh, official uh, uh, webinar presentation and I will give uh, the session back to Dr. Ika. Thank you very much, Prof. And thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Terapong. Thank you, Dr. Hanna. Um, this is a very nice presentation, very in very informative. I, I'm new in infection, but I'm not new. I'm I'm not very familiar to in to. It's not my topic. It's not my. It's uh, Dr. Maria research topic there. So this more. I think, but I think the information is very useful for us to understanding more and to be uh, to consider pityosis as the cause of infection and uh, for our patients. So uh, again, thank you. And also thank you for all the participants here. I hope if we all can open the camera. Uh, we have a small photo session here so for, uh, so, and Dr. Uh, Daud, Mr. Daud, have you posted the link to Google Drive. So Prof. Terapong and Dr. Hanna already gave their material and PDF. So we have uh, uh, put the material in G Drive. And after we took the photo, we can, I, can, I will share the photo in that G Drive so everyone can access that. So anybody already opened their camera? Thank you, Dr. Andy. This is okay. I think there's no one else open their camera, so I will take the photo, the screenshot. I I do the screenshot. Full screen. Okay, get ready, everyone. One, two, three. Okay, again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so much thank too. you. Thank you again. Uh, and this is the end of our webinar. Thank you, everyone. And we can all get some rest and for tomorrow's activity. Thank mm -hmm. you.
see you uh, on the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.